Okie dokie, I think we are live. All right, hello and welcome everyone to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, Food, Climate, and You. My name is Stephanie Keeler. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. Before we get to today's presentation, we just have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we are celebrating Valentine's Day and our former Mississauga Mayor Hazel McCallion's 100th birthday with a dinner special from Capra's Kitchen. So you can order a Valentine's meal through the Riverwood Conservancy, which will be directed to Capra's Kitchen. And a portion of those proceeds will actually go back to protecting nature at Riverwood. For all other events happening in February, please visit the riverwoodconservancy.org. And if you have the financial means to donate, we would greatly appreciate it to keep our programs up and running. Uh, thank you Climate Impact for funding this webinar and several other upcoming climate conscious webinars. Uh, climate Impact is a private foundation and supports local climate change education and action initiatives. So I would like to introduce both of our wonderful guest speakers today. First, we have Colin Cotton from the Mississauga Food Bank. Colin has had a curiosity for ecosystems and aquaria since he was young. Having graduated from the University of Toronto with a focus on animal behavior and ecology, Colin continued to gravitate towards activities involving animal husbandry and care working on sustainable means to provide fresh fish and produce to the community through aquaponics at the river, or sorry, at the Mississauga Food Bank uh, was a natural fit for him. So welcome, Colin. And we Thank also have me. Deanna, who is the Field to Table Coordinator from Ecosource. Deanna loves bringing people together over growing and preparing food. She holds a master's in urban and international development at University of Toronto, where she focused her studies on food security, creation care, and using urban agriculture to build a sense of community. She has helped to develop an earth to table program and successfully engaged newcomers in gardening and cooking workshops. Deanna has managed a rooftop garden while bringing volunteers and community members together to grow and prepare food. She's excited to foster food literacy, accessibility, and excitement around local food. So welcome as well, Deanna. If you have questions for either of our um, panelists today, please write them in the Q&A tab in Zoom. And for those that are watching on Facebook, I will try to get those as well. Thank you everyone for joining us and I will turn things over first to Colin. Thank you. All right. So I'm just gonna get my screen going here. So let's see. And here we go. So firstly, thank you so much for having me and thank you for everyone tuning in today. I'm very excited to be talking to you guys today about fighting hunger through aquaponics at the Mississauga Food Bank. And just a few housekeeping notes as well on my end. Um, this project that we have, our aquaponics farm, is actually called Aquagrow Farms, um, but it is under the Mississauga Food Bank. So if you want to learn more, definitely check out either website. Um, and a huge thank you to our sponsors, Enbridge and Electra, for helping us do what we do. So I'd just like to start by talking a little bit about the Mississauga Food Bank, just some background info. Um, our vision is a Mississauga where no one goes hungry. And we do that by relieving hunger uh, through promoting and providing access to healthy food for people in need. So that's kind of where aquaponics and our farm fits into this picture. Um, we are providing additional healthy food by growing our own on site uh, to distribute to people in the community. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're not selling any of our food, even though people do get interested and they do ask if they can buy some. Um, it is all going out to people within the community in need. As well, um, we are the largest in the central food bank in Sasaga. So we centralize all our donations here, and then we distribute to over 50 other member agencies across the city. So if you're in Mississauga and you need food, you can be rest assured that you can look up somewhere in your local neighborhood and find one of these pantries or snack programs that you can access to give you the food you need. And we do know from our numbers that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the need has risen. So if you do know anyone who needs it, definitely take a look 
um, we are out in the community to help. And actually, we are also completely, uh, almost completely supported by um, our donors and our community. So uh, we do run a distribution center here. So it's not uh, your typical food bank where people picture a soup kitchen. It's more like a, a Costco type setup. Um, but through this network, we are able to provide over 3 million healthy meals every single year. So it's no small feat. So for those of you who can't visit our food bank in person right now, just because of the safety of the pandemic, um, I have a little video here that you guys can watch, which gives you a little taste of what it looks like. This is actually a video of our older farm. So our smaller, about 500 square foot farm, but I think it's good enough to give you guys a little taste. Uh, those of you guys with headphones might want to turn down your volume a little bit, uh, just depending on how loud the music will be. But I'll play it right now for you guys right now. So um, maybe we'll dive a little bit deeper and talk about some of the terms to get familiar with. So at the very basic level, what aquaponics is, is a combination of aquaculture, which is the farming of fish, and that's kind of meshed together with hydroponics, which is farming without any soil. So the benefit of having aquaponics is that you get two crops out of this. You get your protein crop from your fish, and then you get your greens crop from your vegetables. And we do harvest both. We grow some tilapia on site, um, as you saw in those videos there. Sometimes they are white, sometimes they're black. They come in all sorts of different colors. Um, but when you fillet them and we hand them out, they do taste the same, we've been told. Um, but this picture actually illustrates very well the synergistic relationship between uh, the fish and the plants in the system. It really is a synergy. So both are helping each other out in the system. Um, essentially, it's the fish who are providing waste to fertilize our plants, and then the plants are also cleaning the water for the fish. Uh, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that further on, but some of you guys might be wondering, well, why did we start this project? And in Canada, as far as we know, we have been told that we are the first food bank in Canada to have an aquaponics farm. And right now, uh, the picture on the right, where I'm standing with the two fish tanks, um, is a good representation of the scale. So um, we have right now three 110 gallon fish tanks. They're stocked with roughly 40 to 50 fish, depending on what our stocking density is like. Uh, on the left, you can see some of our raft tanks. Right there, we're growing some romaine as well as some bok choy. But really with aquaponics, that's the beauty of it. You can use this technology to grow all sorts of veggies, all sorts of fruits as well. Uh, we mainly focus on things that have a quick turnaround time. Uh, with the fish side as well, tilapia are pretty much bulletproof fish, so we grow them because you can also harvest them to feed, but people have done things like uh, koi or salmon or trout in Florida because they're Floridians, they do alligators, but uh, that's something we're not going to graduate to anytime soon, I don't think. But the three main reasons why we started this was, of course, to create a source of healthy produce and protein. So we harvest our greens every single week uh, with the help of volunteers like this gentleman here and the fish are harvested every two to three months based on how they're growing. But beyond the tangible benefits is the educational element. So here's a great picture of one of our staff um, educating some kids. Uh, when we were open before the pandemic we would often have hockey teams come in, scout groups, school kids, uh, some of them paying attention, some of them not. Uh, hopefully you get to some of them but it's a great way to educate them about where their food might have come from. And people uh, usually just pick up something from the grocery store and they expect that's 
the that's what the product always looked like. But this is a great way to educate people that, uh, that things are a little bit different on the farm. And then finally, uh, drawing attention to the need of fresh food. So because aquaponic is, aquaponics is one of those up and coming technologies, there's a whole bunch of people who are interested in it, but what better way to get people on board um, than bringing awareness about the poverty issue in Mississauga. And it's somewhat sad that people are unaware that there is such a large poverty issue in Mississauga, um, but aquaponics allows us to start conversation about that. So what are the benefits of aquaponics? Why did we decide to do this? And within Ontario, we know that roughly one fifth of Ontario's food banks have some sort of association with a community garden or garden plot. So there is that need to provide your own means of supplying your food bank clients, the people who are getting food from the food bank. So the only difference with us is that uh, we have fish on our farm. So it's not too uncommon, just that we have the addition of fish. The challenge for us in Mississauga, where it's highly urbanized, is uh, that we have a large population that needs to be fed, but we don't have any farmland near us. So uh, that's essentially having some food insecurity in the city. It's considered a food desert because we just don't have any more agricultural land left. So this picture here is a representation of the land use in Mississauga, and each different color represents a type of land use. So for instance, to get you guys oriented, the big red splotch over to the top right is Toronto Pearson Airport. And you'll see that it's kind of covered in all this blue stuff. And that's actually the industrial uh, building. So that makes a lot of sense. It's near the airport, things are going in and out. But if you were to guess what color represents vacant and farmland, it's actually much, much less. So um, it's the light blue portion. So you can see the percentages broken down here. Um, it's actually only about 4% remaining. And you would think that this is something that people would recognize and say, well, we have a large population to feed here. Shouldn't we bring some of this farmland back? But as far as we know, there's only one remaining working farm in Mississauga. It's towards the Northwest end and it's right by the highway. It's kind of out of place, um, but it's still there because it is a heritage site. So um, what we've seen in recent research is that there's been the most change in vacant farmland in Mississauga and it's in the decline. So by having a community that really needs this food, yet it's not here, uh, I think a good solution would be to bring in uh, agricultural uh, means that are urbanized like we have here with aquaponics. As a food bank, we're really paying attention to the needs of our food bank clients. So what we found is that healthy food can cost up to three times more than unhealthy alternatives. So especially now, if you're thinking about COVID, that's really affected our supply chain. So you might go to the grocery store and say, well, hey, these things cost a lot more than I remember. Um, if you're thinking of a little bit further back, when we had a shortage of lettuce and broccoli and cauliflower, all that stuff was coming from California. And what had ha happened there was that they had a drought and then they followed that with a flood. So everything that was happening there led to shortages here and it drove the head, uh, a head of lettuce that usually would cost about a dollar a head back then um, to about $5. So if you're thinking about a family who's trying to make ends meet and really stretch their dollar to get food on the table, they may have to go to these unhealthy alternatives just to uh, keep everyone fed. And as I said, people might be surprised here that roughly 15% or one in seven of the people in our community in Mississauga live below the poverty line. So these are regular people just like you and me who are going to their nine to five jobs and uh, your family, your friends, and your neighbors, that's why it's so hidden. Um, people would walk past you on the street and would not think otherwise. But um, I have found from speaking to people that come and pick up food here, these are people who just have come on hard times and especially more nowadays. Um, most of these people are spending the majority of their income on shelter and the majority of households using a food bank here earn incomes below $2,000 a month. So that's not much left to purchase food with. 
And that's why food banks are available all across the city for these people to maybe take one thing off their plates um, by getting some food from the food bank. And so they can spend their money elsewhere to help themselves get back on their feet quicker. So something that's very interesting to me is the sustainability aspect of aquaponics. And one thing that I think aquaponics does really well is that it allocates resources excellently. So even though you saw a lot of water in that video and aquaponics really is sustained on water, you can use up to 90 or 95% less water. And the reason for that is that you're not spraying a large area um, and it's being lost in the ground or um, evaporated. It's just cycling from tank to tank to tank. And we don't dump it in one go. It's just being recirculated through the system because the plants are cleaning the water. But um, a lesser or overlooked um, non-renewable resource is soil. So non-renewable means that once we use it, it takes a very long time to renew itself or come back. And once you run out of soil, it's gonna be very hard to grow food. So we're losing this through urbanization as we've seen in Mississauga, but also through poor farming practices, degradation like salinization, erosion or pollution. So this could be a global issue when we run out of good fertile soil. As well, we here at the food bank do not use any chemicals, fertilizers, or pesticides. Um, usually by the nature of aquaponics, it's very hard to implement any of these because uh, chemicals or pesticides could be very harmful to your fish. So as a result, you have to be very creative with how you deal with things like pests. So for instance, we would have to employ something called integrated pest management. And that's pretty much just a fancy term for uh, for instance, if you were to be on a farm and you had aphids, some people would introduce ladybugs to predate on the aphids and take care of them. And that's something that doesn't use any chemicals. That's an example of integrated pest management. What we use is something called nematodes that will predate on the larva of fungus gnats. So we make sure that they get stopped at the young stage and they don't overrun our farm. As well, if people are using an aquaponics farm and uh, are looking at one of these things, usually one thing that they would implement is fertilizers. Uh, often people will add chelated iron to their water to just help the production of our crops. But uh, we haven't found a need for it here. Our source water in Mississauga is actually quite good. And as a food bank, we're always looking at uh, increasing food security and especially in urban areas. So if you look outside your window right now, um, you'll see that there's snow on the ground and you wouldn't be able to have your garden at home outside in the backyard. But we're very fortunate to have an indoor farm where we're growing all 365 days of the year. So right now we got lettuce going out every single week as if uh, we were growing in peak growing season. We never really stop. As well, we're local. So we harvest our plants in the morning and it usually goes out to the end user within hours. So uh, either on a truck through our um, member agencies or people can come and pick it up here. And we've started because of COVID and the increased need, we've started an on-site food bank. And usually that's where our lettuce goes to. So we harvest it in the morning and someone can consume it for lunch that day or even dinner. And because it's not coming from places like California or Mexico, like we spoke about in the previous example, you're using way less food miles. So food miles being the amount of distance that food takes from production to your plate. So because we're just staying within the city, it's very, very little. And as a result, you have less CO2 emissions. On the fish side um, and looking at protein, it's a really efficient source of protein, just fish in general. So what we mean by that is that if you wanted to produce a pound of fish meat, you would have to feed that fish roughly 1.1 pounds of food. So it's almost a one to one ratio. You're almost getting exactly what you put into it back. If you were to look at something like pork, um, to get a pound of pork, it's a little bit worse. It's 2.9 pounds of food to get one pound of pork back, but even worse so is a pound of beef, which takes 6.8 pounds of food to get one pound of beef back. And the reason there's this huge discrepancy here is that if you look at a cow, it's such a 
heavy, large animal, it takes up a lot of energy just to move around every day. So it's burning off all its calories that it's eating just to move around. Whereas if you look at a fish, they're very buoyant. So they kind of spend their lives floating around in water and they're also cold blooded. So their metabolism is a lot slower. So they're not really burning off much of their energy that you're feeding them. And it's actually no surprise that aquaculture is growing in popularity across the world. And there's now uh, more farmed fish than there is beef. Um, the only protein source that I think beats out fish is insects like crickets. So um, unless everyone, especially in North America, is on board with eating crickets, I think fish and other aquaculture will probably have to do. So how does it work? And for those of you who can't be here, I've got a little bit of a video to show you a representation of one of our tanks. Um, so just the graphic version, but also the, uh, the real life version over there. So there's some of our fish from a long time ago and they're just enjoying themselves in their tank there. But we stock them with now tilapia and we feed them. And as a result, they produce waste all the time. They're fed three times a day. So just like we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when they produce their waste, there's naturally occurring bacteria on all these surfaces. So this bacteria takes that waste and converts it into fertilizer for the plants through several biological processes. So we don't add this bacteria, it just uh, it eventually colonizes when it realizes that the, there's food from the fish. So uh, they show up after a few months of starting the farm. The next step in the process is our raft tank. So here's a little cross section of our raft tanks and they're called raft tanks because all our plants are floating on styrofoam rafts. And this type of aquaponics is called deep water culture or DWC for short. So the roots are always hanging out in the water and they can take up the nutrients from the fish all the time. And if you think about water as a medium, there's, it's a lot more fluid, so there's a lot more flow. So the nutrient flow in there is very, very efficient. So they're getting everything that they need to get. And you might think, well, won't the roots rot? But um, usually rot is due to oxygen deprivation. So we do have bubblers going on underneath the rafts to kind of keep the roots happy as well as um, just keeping them nice and clean. And finally, it isn't just the plants that are getting a free ride from the fish, but they're also providing a service back. So as I mentioned earlier, they are filtering the water, which recirculates back in one big loop to the fish tanks where the process can start itself all over again. And so here's a couple pictures from our recent harvest. When we harvest our greens, usually we do put them in vented bags and there's a label on there to tell you what variety it is and when it was harvested and where it came from. Um, we usually aim for about a little over 100 heads per week and our goal every year is to do about 28,000 servings per year. So um, even though we have a small farm, we are turning out quite a lot. As well, we started, which I'm very excited about, we started a uh, recent microgreens project. So this is some of our pea shoots that we harvested recently. And these guys take very, very little energy. So uh, fast turnaround time, usually when we seed them, it's about 10 days. It's completely soilless as well. So there's no soil whatsoever in the farm. And um, it doesn't really take much light or uh, nutrients, yet they're very, very nutritious. And that's something that I can actually say you can try at home safely. So definitely check that out. Uh, with our fish, we have our tilapia harvested. Um, they go through a purging process here, which means that we don't feed them for roughly a week. And the reason being is that fish is a very mild tasting meat. So it tends to take on the flavor of its diet. Um, so if we were to eat one of the fish in our tanks right now, um, they would taste very muddy or fishy, just like if, as if we were to eat their fish food. So we make sure that they clean out their guts um, and you get a better quality meat out of that. But we harvest about 50 pounds of fish every two to three months um, with a goal of over 2000 servings per year. We're actually harvesting a batch of fish next week. So pretty exciting. Um, and we work with one of our food banks that has a teaching kitchen on site who's able to fillet our fish and either use it for their process uh, uh, programs over there, or they send it back to us um, vacuum sealed and nicely packed. 
and then we were able to distribute it. So it goes out on one of our trucks, like so. You might have seen these guys across the city. We've got three trucks on the road pretty much five days a week. And uh, that's helping us hit our overall goal, which is to feed our neighbors in need. And if you're able to see on the webcam later on behind me, there's some pictures on the wall, as well as these guys on the screen here. These are people within our community. So people you might have come across, someone you might know, a neighbor, a friend. Um, and these are the people who we are trying to feed. So if that has at all interested you and you really want to get involved, definitely check out our website. So the MississaugaFoodBank.org is probably the best hub to go to. And uh, you can find out ways to volunteer or organize a fundraiser or food drive. Right now, we are taking limited volunteers just in the interest of safety with the pandemic, but there's ways to get involved for sure. So definitely check out, uh, out a look on there. Um, shout out to two of my really good volunteers who are right in the thick of it doing some transplanting there. Um, that's Kate and Claire, so hello to them if they're watching. Um, as well, there's a tab to learn about what we do. So another one of our very sustainable initiatives is Reclaim Fresh. And what that is, is our food rescue program. Um, it's a shame that roughly 58% of all food produced in Canada is wasted. That's 36 million metric tons. So a huge amount of wastage. And this is food that's perfectly fine uh, for the most part that can go to people who need it. So through our food rescue program, we can, uh, Fresh, we were able to save 400,000 pounds of food that would have otherwise gone to waste. But if you want to learn about how to do that on your own, uh, a good way to cut down on food waste at home is to get familiar with best before dates. So a best before date is not a bad after date. So people will see it and they say, oh, it's one day past, I have to throw it away. That's not true. Um, usually, as long as you've stored it at the correct temperature and you don't get it wet, etc., cetera, um, this stuff can last for quite some time. Within Canada, there's only a few items that actually do require a best before date or an expiry date. And these are things that are very sensitive, like baby food and formula or supplements. So for the most part, your food is good. Definitely cook it up um, or make a different dish with it and you can eat it perfectly fine. And finally, uh, if you were to donate to our food bank or any other, uh, definitely check out on their website what they're looking for. We have our most needed items listed there of what we're looking for right now. And it's mainly nutrient dense foods like canned fish and meat and uh, fruits and vegetables. But uh, when people think about the food bank, of course, the human element comes in and they think about the kids and they really want to donate some snacks like chips and candy but uh, please definitely think about the uh, nutrient dense stuff. That's the sort of stuff that we really need. Um, as well, we would not be here without the support from our community. So monetary donations really do go a long way. It helps us buy things like milk or eggs that we can't get from those food drive bins. Uh, also keeps our trucks on the road so that we can deliver this stuff. So if you can, definitely check out our website for a link to that. So on behalf of the Mississauga Food Bank, thank you everyone who's listening right now. Um, I was very happy to share some information with you, but if there's any questions that I don't get to today, please feel free to contact me at this information here, um, as well check out our two websites and our Facebook or Instagram. And one final big thank you to the Riverwood Conservancy for having me here today so I can uh, share this all with you guys today. Thank you. That was awesome, Colin. Thank you so much. It's so informative. You guys are doing really, really cool stuff there. Um, I think we're going to get to two questions before we hand it off to Deanna, if that's okay. Um, I have one question. Oh, all the questions are coming in. We're going to try to answer the bulk of them at the end of the presentation. I did see one here. Um, are the greens started from seed or small starter plants? Everything we grow is started from seed. And the reason being is that we don't want to introduce any pests uh, that might be growing on some little seedlings. And it's just easier for us to have a uh, turnaround time like that. We start it on a conveyor belt system. So we start the seeds far in advance. So we are able to maintain that harvest. 
Great. And then one more question. Um, I heard farm fish is bad for you. Is that true? So that's kind of um, answering a little bit of a myth there. See if you have an answer. Sure. Yeah. Um, it really depends. And I think in Canada, we have very good aquaculture practices in place that uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. So we are very concerned about the consumer. And they did do a blind study in BC about people if they prefer the taste of farmed fish versus uh, wild caught fish. And the vast majority, I think it was a little over 80% or so in a blind taste test preferred the farmed fish. And I think that's due to the fact that we just have more control when you can farm the fish. So for instance, like I mentioned the purging process, um, there's more control of what goes into that fish. Whereas if you wild caught it, um, you don't know what it might've eaten that day. Um, you don't know if it might've gotten into something. So it's just uh, a little bit of a more precaution and we can feed them on a certain schedule with a certain diet. Okay, wonderful, thank you, Colin. And you're having a, a lot of questions coming in. So we're gonna get to those at the end of the next presentation. Deanna, if you are ready, you are free to share your slides. And Deanna is from EcoSource once again. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for having me. And thanks, Colin, for that great presentation. Um, definitely learned a lot. So I am just going to uh, share my screen here. And I might just turn off my video just to make things go a little smoother. Okay, so uh, yeah, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, my name is Deanna. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am from Ecosource. My role there is the field to table coordinator. So I help facilitate a lot of uh, food skills and cooking workshops. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about um, climate activism in your kitchen and things that you can do to kind of engage with these really big issues about food and climate, um, yeah, in a way that's right. Um, at your plate and at your table. So um, for those who might not be as familiar with Ecosource, uh, we are based in Mississauga and do programming um, all throughout Peel. Uh, we're an environmental um, organization bringing green living to our community and we specialize in fun hands-on programs that focus on how each of us can change our daily habits to become better environmental citizens. Um, over the past year, we've shifted a lot of our programming um, to online webinars and other kind of supported um, action kits. Um, however, we're still able to open and operate our garden and urban agriculture spaces last year, and we're able to safely hold some programming in those spaces um, kind of in line with the current health recommendations. So we were really um, glad to be able to get outside and do that. So there's a few different areas that Ecosource focuses on. Um, we've got a waste reduction team. They hold um, uh, school audits and waste challenges as well as online workshops aimed at students. We've got teacher education modules to equip teachers throughout Peel to uh, bring green learning and environmental learning into their classroom. Um, sustainability education, food literacy. So that's what we're doing here today. And that's a large part of my role in terms of cooking and food skills workshops as well as food systems education. Um, community gardens and urban agriculture. We've got eight community gardens uh, sites across Mississauga as well as a 15,000 square foot um, teaching market garden in Mississauga um, as well as uh, youth leadership programs kind of all throughout these other areas um, that foster youth initiative and leadership in environmentalism. So you can see here our garden spaces um, through Mississauga and we've also got our community hub where we have our teaching kitchen um, that we were um, yeah, holding different uh, food skills workshops and um, social enterprise product creation was happening there as well. Um, so I can show you, so on the left you can see a photo of yeah preservation workshop this happened pre-COVID but in the other photos, you can see some of the programs that we rolled out in response um, to COVID and kind of adjusting our programming from there. We created a meal kit uh, delivery program from Mississauga, as well as um, created some different food skills and kind of cook along webinars um, online. 
So just before we get started into our discussions around uh, climate action and food, um, I just want to acknowledge kind of the scope and considerations as we enter into this conversation. Um, just and want to acknowledge kind of the time and place that we're at now. Um, the pandemic has exposed a lot of the pre-existing um, inequalities and gaps in our food systems, and there can be a certain degree of stress and uncertainty around food. So I think it's just important to name that as we go into this. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that everyone is in a different situation, has access to different resources and things that they might be able to do or not do. Um, food is such a huge topic and people are, and all of us are coming here with a wide variety of experiences um, and resources. So full about being respectful to others and ourselves. Um, and then the tips that we'll talk about and the ways that you can take action um, they're meant to be empowering and ways to make the greatest impact as an individual. However, they're certainly not uh, necessarily one size fits all. And it's important to acknowledge that um, issues surrounding food waste, availability of certain types of food, and food insecurity are elements of a broken food system and can actually uh, limit some of the actions that an individual might be able to take. So um, while this is framed in the context of individual action, yeah, we just want to make sure that we're acknowledging the systems that impact people and choices in our current food system. So uh, when I talk about food systems, um, let's just situate ourselves in a food system and kind of figure out what that means. And um, this will help us flesh out the connection between cooking and climate a little bit more. So a food system um, is all of the activities and steps involved in the growing, processing, transportation and consumption of food. So you can see here, we've got a diagram of all the different steps, um, kind of the complete journey of a food item from growth to disposal with different stages. And it, that might look different from one food item to another. So for any given food item, you have to grow it, harvest it, process it, whether that just includes uh, sorting and cleaning, uh, packaging it, marketing, retail, transportation, um, as well as consumption and disposal, whether that's composting or going to the landfill. Um, so say if we're comparing an apple to applesauce, these stages might look different or be more or less intensive uh, for the amount of processing and packaging involved. Um, and uh, additionally, not all of these steps are themselves necessary, but there's ways to cut out stages of the loop or reduce the impact of those stages. Um, so we want to also remember that at each of these stages, there, there are people involved doing these tasks and uh, are affected by the way uh, that these stages are carried out. So when I talk about the environmental impact of the different stages of the food systems, a lot of um, that comes from what's called inputs and outputs. So um, an input is something that's introduced to the system and an output is a waste material from the system. So at the growing and harvesting stages, um, some examples of inputs might be uh, human labor, soil, sunlight, seeds, fertilizer, water, and machinery. So those are all the things needed to um, start uh, producing the food item. And then some outputs would be potentially fertilizer runoff, gray water emissions, and plant waste. So depending on what the inputs and outputs are affects kind of the overall uh, impact of food items. So for our purposes, uh, we'll focus on kind of the consumption stage, stage and maybe the retail stage as this is where um, individuals kind of primarily interact with the food system. So just to kind of yeah, recap that a little bit, when we're talking about food and climate and the environmental impact, a lot of it comes from uh, the different resources that are used and disposed of while growing and producing food. Um, and just, you know, by its nature, how food is grown and distributed um, has an impact on the environment because it's part of the environment and such a big part of our lives. So um, land and water, carbon emissions um, and soil management, human rights, they're all issues that are impacted by how we grow and consume food. So these are a lot of issues and it kind of can be tricky to navigate and figure out what's the best choice to make when you're in the grocery store or planning what you're wanting to eat. 
um, there's a lot of different information and it can sometimes be overwhelming to try to make the best choice. Or um, if you're wanting to cook with the climate in mind, what's the best way to go about it when you're trying to balance kind of all of these different issues. Um, so when we're looking at food and the potential impacts and issues, we can kind of look at it as an opportunity to make a positive impact just because on the one hand, it's about what's up what's immediately in front of us and what's on our plate, but it has all these other ties to these larger issues. So we have a chance to, um, in our own context, make choices and to just be more mindful kind of in how we get engage with the food system. So going through all of that, let's zoom in a little bit. Um, think about our kitchens and the food that we choose to make and share with each other. Um, so we'll think about our choices and kind of our own context and just a few tangible ways that we can more mindfully interact with our food system. So um, there's a few different uh, tangible ways that you can do this. Uh, we're gonna zoom in on a couple of them here, but just a brief overview um, for to start off with. Um, so eating more plants is a pretty big one and we'll dive into that more a bit later. Uh, just generally speaking, eating things lower down on the food chain has a lower carbon footprint. Um, eating in season and choosing to uh, support local uh, suppliers is um, they usually go kind of hand in hand and that has a lot to do with like reducing the amount of transportation of food and packaging as well as being able to support farmers um, and producers that you might know have more sustainable practices. Um, buying in bulk really helps um, reduce the amount of uh, packaging and um, reducing and composting food waste is a really big one that we're going to go into a little bit more as well. Um, planning your meals can help just um, kind of orient yourself to what you're wanting to eat and kind of making sure that you're using up what you already have and um, just kind of fostering a bit of an intentionality around things. Um, and as well as increasing food literacy. So all of these pieces um, are kind of a part of food literacy, being able to uh, navigate choices about food, interpret recipes, as well as just practical food skills like knife skills and uh, different cooking techniques. So let's go a bit deeper into some of these um, strategies. So eating more plants. Um, so I do just want to say I, um, I'm not a nutritionist, so if you're thinking of making any big dietary changes, it's a great idea to consult your doctor. Um, but uh, eating more plants and incorporating them into your diet has the potential to make the greatest impact for kind of a small change that you can make in your life. It's a bit, it's on the lower end of some of the higher impact actions you can make. Like say if you were switching to an electric car or um, avoiding one transatlantic flight, um, eating more plant-based food is a great way to, is kind of in that category in terms of the impact that it can make. So substituting plant protein into your diet has the potential to reduce individual emissions related to diet by about 60%. So that's a pretty big chunk. Um, and so when I'm talking about plant-based or plant-focused, uh, what does that mean? It, I'm not necessarily saying everyone needs to become a vegetarian or a vegan, but um, plant-based is kind of, um, there's a few different strategies that you can use to kind of put plants at the center of your meal um, so, and building up recipes from them as like a main ingredient or just focusing on them more. Uh, you might have heard different strategies like meatless Mondays where one day of the week you um, don't eat any meat um, or there's different ways that you can adapt recipes to include more plants not necessarily completely taking out meat, but um, supplementing the meal with veggies um, or building with uh, recipes around the veggies as a main ingredient rather than starting with meat. So you can kind of think of it like a cooking challenge in terms of what are ways that you can adjust or adapt a recipe. Um, some addition and substitution ideas that are pretty easy. Um, so say if you're making a spaghetti sauce with some ground beef, something you could do is cut out half the beef and supplement it with red lentils or same thing for 
if you're making a stir fry, um, you don't have to necessarily completely substitute the chicken or other meat, you could, but you could add in some baked tofu. Um, and these super stew that you're making kind of in the last minute of it simmering, if you throw in some fresh spinach, it'll wilt. And it's a great way to um, add in some cooked uh, sources of iron and protein into your diet without too much extra prep or recipe modification. So uh, you can think about, yeah, what just veggies that you love that you can add to other dishes. Um, and a lot of other cultures around the world um, have historically eaten plant-based diets. So uh, that means there's, um, so there's some guiding questions that you might want to uh, look into when you're exploring different plant proteins and looking into other ways of how you can, um, yeah, uh, explore ways of cooking. You can think about who is growing or raising your crop, where is your protein grown or produced, and was your protein made with sustainable practices. So um, another aspect of what we eat um, and how we eat is uh, reducing and composting food waste. Um, so Colin talked a little bit about this as well. Um, so food systems, if you're wasting food, that means that you've wasted all of the resources um, put into growing and distributing food, as well as the wasted food itself. Um, there's this statistic that I read that kind of blew my mind a little bit that a head of lettuce can take 25 years to decompose in a landfill. So that's a lot of um, some waste. If some food waste is unavoidable, like say an apple core or orange peel or banana peel. Um, but in Canada, we waste 2.2 million tons of avoidable food waste each year. So that means something that's either stuck in the back of your fridge or um, something that you didn't use in time. Um, and so what that equals is about 9.8 million tons of carbon dioxide. And what that looks like is each year um, about 2.1 million cars on the road. So um, that's a pretty big impact there. And some strategies to um, yeah, to address this is, as Colin mentioned, you know, get to know your best before dates and um, proper food storage, either when you cook something or when you first bring something home from the grocery store. Uh, that's a really great way of extending the shelf life, learning um, yeah, how to use things kind of in different ways, either using all parts of the plant or the ingredients or um, using leftovers in new ways, as well as um, choosing recipes and being mindful about things that you cook um, that use up all of a perishable ingredient. So sometimes there's recipes that um, they ask you to use maybe like half of a head of a cauliflower or three quarters of some other ingredient. And then you're left over with kind of this like with a small piece that you're not necessarily sure what to do with and don't really have anything to put it into, and then that ends up getting wasted. Um, freezing is a really great um, strategy, knowing how to properly freeze and thaw items so that they uh, don't lose their flavor and texture um, is a great strategy on um, storing food that you, might, that you know you might not necessarily use in the moment. Um, and then meal planning. So meal planning um, can take a few different forms. Um, one thing that you can do is just, it can be as simple as writing it out and just kind of thinking about what you want to eat for the week. Um, so when you're thinking about that, it's a good idea to um, choose recipes kind of based on um, what you've got in your pantry or as you're in your fridge already as a starting point. Um, getting to know what ingredients can substitute for each other uh, based on what's in season or veggies or grains can be kind of cooked in a similar way. So for example, if you're roasting carrots, you might be able to roast beets with them as well since they're both root vegetables and would have similar cooking requirements. So um, the idea behind meal planning is using similar ingredients kind of in multiple ways throughout the week. Um, and you can start with what you know. If you have a couple of go-to dishes, you don't necessarily have to create this elaborate meal plan that's um, that's um, yeah, like starting, like trying to do all these different cuisines and all that. Um, if you have a couple of dishes, you can kind of slot those in and plan it out and plan your grocery trips around that. Um, so yeah, again, proper storage, um, knowing what stores well. And um, so for example, like cooked rice doesn't last long in the fridge. 
but you could, if you're making it um, in a dish that you wanted to freeze, it freezes better in kind of a stew or saucy dish. Um, and then, yeah, just writing it out. So here's a sample kind of meal plan that can help you uh, think about, yeah, what ingredients you want to use up and what you might want to buy that um, and kind of use strategically through the week. So we've got our salad. We're using the fresh ingredients kind of at the beginning of the week. In the middle of the week, if there's any uh, remaining fresh ingredients, um, they can be um, yeah, eaten or cooked in the soup. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the most fresh or crunchy things, but we have a way kind of in place to use them. And then at the end of the week, uh, using veggies that store pretty well, so like sweet potatoes and things like that, so, so that I know uh, when I buy them at the grocery store, they'll still be good by the end of the week and they won't have gone to waste. And then lastly, kind of building in a strategy to use leftovers. So these recipes are called um, kind of like fridge harvest recipes. So that means it's a flexible recipe that I can kind of throw in a lot of different ingredients. Maybe if they're kind of getting mushy in the back of my fridge, it might not matter as much. Um, I can still use them in a way that tastes great and can be mixed with a bunch of different things. So all of these um, skills, kind of reading recipes and um, interpreting them and kind of being a bit more mindful about our food and where it comes from is called food literacy. So it's the uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes um, necessary to choose, grow, prepare, and enjoy healthy food um, to support uh, one's health and community and the environment, as well as um, understanding the impact of our food choices on our health, the environment, and our economy. So since food is such a big part of our lives and our ecosystems, uh, we can make choices um, that have pretty big ripple effects and that also taste good. Um, so making active choices on how to engage in our food system helps us better connect with our community. And all of this can happen in our kitchen. So if you want to learn more about um, supporting sustainable food system and peel, um, an organization doing a lot of work around this in terms of, of developing a peel food charter and things like that about um, agriculture and eco economy, community engagement, um, and so on. And so if you're wanting to learn more about food systems, that'd be another great place uh, to look into. Um, and yeah, if you wanted to learn more about Ecosource, we've got a lot of different um, online webinar offerings about gardening and cooking that we host either through Zoom or on social media. Um, so if, you, if you're looking to learn more about growing your own food, feel free to check us out. And there's lots of different ways to get involved. Um, and yes, yeah, so I just wanted to thank Stephanie and Riverwood for having us here today so that we can share with you all. And um, thanks so much everyone for um, tuning in. Wonderful, Deanna, thank you so much. Um, you offered some pretty surprising statistics, but uh, definitely offered uh, alternatives and solutions to those, so thank you. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, one of them is actually from a teacher and she has written on our Facebook live stream um, and wondering if Ecosource offers help to start community gardens and sustainable education at schools. Sorry, could um, I, sorry, I think my internet cut out in a second. So does, can you say that again? Yeah, it may be my internet as well. <laughs> it may be a combination. Um, a teacher is asking if Ecosource helps to start community gardens and sustainable education at schools as well. Yeah, yeah, we do. We've had a, uh, we have a few different kind of partnership programs um, that we help. Uh, we love to support teachers and different um, green uh, groups that they have at schools. Um, one thing that we are we host a kind of a how to start a community gardens workshop so if you have a group or an organization that you're looking to start a community garden um we uh we host those webinars and this is kind of the time of year that we do that so yeah i'd encourage the teacher to they can either reach out to me and i can connect them with those resources or follow us on on our social media and, and check that out wonderful
And um, a question from Leslie, this may be good for both of you. Um, are rooftop gardens difficult to establish in Mississauga? Um, I'm not super familiar with a ton of the like the zoning stuff in particular. I would encourage them. I know uh, UTM, University of Toronto Mississauga has um, a rooftop garden. So um, you could definitely check them out and kind of uh, get the advice there for that and, and support for that. Yeah, I was actually going to mention UTM as well. Um, I'm not too familiar with rooftop gardens in Mississauga either. Um, but those resources are great as well. And Colin, I have a question for you too. Um, when you look at the total cost of running your operation, how sustainable do you think aquaponics is for the future? So they're talking about the cost per month and to maintain the operation as a whole as well. Right. So from our experience, what we uh, noticed is that the upfront a capital cost is what's going to be the biggest cost. Um, to sustain our farm right now at the size that it is, it's roughly a little over 2000 a year just for uh, supplies and materials. We, it seems like we have a lot of stuff going on in terms of grow lights and pumps and stuff, but um, our lights aren't on all the time. They're, the photo period for our plants is only about 12 hours a day. But um, the only things that are running all the time are our water pumps and our air blowers. So those are only about 100 watts a piece, of which we have three. So it is still very sustainable in terms of an energy cost sense. Um, and materials, stuff like seeds and rock wool and getting young fish, if you don't have a nursery, um, those do uh, are fairly inexpensive. But yes, the upfront cost, as with any uh, startup farm or startup business, is where the main cost is going to be. Okay, and do you need any special lighting to grow the food? I think this is for Colin as well. So we use LED lights as well as HID lights. Um, that's mainly because we're indoors. So we do need that supplemental lighting. But not really, you don't really need anything special. Sunlight works the best, of course, that's nature. Um, but for our LED lights, they're purple because we've uh, taken advantage of the spectrums of light that the plants really like, which are mainly red and blue. So with the LED lights only taking advantage of the red and blue, you're using less electricity on the other spectrums of light that the plant doesn't really need. Um, so it's a little bit more energy efficient that way. If you want to grow at home, the sun is just as good as any of the lights that we have. And Deanna, I have one more question for you. Um, you shared some individual actions people can take to be more mindful in our food consumption and fight climate change. What role do you think collective action and or systematic change plays in changing our food system to be more sustainable and just? Long question, <laughs> a big picture one for sure. <laughs> for sure, yeah. And um, I think that keeping that in mind is kind of helpful to, yeah, when we're looking at food systems, there's obviously a ton of different issues and ways that people can engage either individually or collectively and kind of at different levels. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of, um, yeah, I, I, so I narrowed the scope a bit to just the individual action, but. Um, and so, yeah, kind of focusing on that for, there's a, um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that people can engage and that have different levels of impact. But I think it's, yeah, there's uh, definitely, as we saw, like, there's lots of overlap and kind of um, things like that kind of in our food systems. And so it's not just necessarily an individual thing. It is a, a systemic issue, but there's lots of, yeah, ways to kind of uh, engage on that level. Wonderful. And we're getting so many uh, thank yous and great presentations in the comment section. Um, I'd just like to say if you are a teacher watching with your students right now, if you could just comment in the chat box on Facebook or on Zoom and let us know how many students are watching. It's really great for our statistics to keep uh, the number of participants we have. And um, one last thing I'll read from the teacher that asked about Ecosource. She said, thank you so, so much for the info and your enthusiasm. Young leaders is what we need specifically on these times to inspire our young ones. So that's a great way to end it. 
Um, I want to say thank you both to Colin and Deanna from the Mississauga Food Bank and from Ecosource. Thank you so much for your informative presentations. It was wonderful. And thank you everyone for tuning in today. Stay safe and we will see you all soon in the next webinar. Goodbye. Thank you.